surgic acid diethylamide, LSD. The film that you see is considered by many experts to be the closest illustration of the effects of a hallucinogenic. This is the story of a 30-year search by U.S. intelligence agencies to perfect mind control. Some of those engaged in that search have agreed to talk about it for the first time. One said, I think every last one of us felt sorry to attempt this kind of thing. We knew we were crossing the line. John Gittinger, recently retired chief psychologist for the CIA. This is the first time Gittinger has been interviewed publicly. It was one of the first times that anybody had run into a powerful drug that was different than anything else that they knew anything about. The CIA was not the only government agency interested in the possibilities LSD and other drugs presented for mind control. The Army Chemical Corps first started working with the CIA and then branched off on its own. It too tested drugs on unwitting victims. On the purpose of the drug testing, to produce symptoms similar to those that you see in schizophrenia. On how much the patient knew about all this. We didn't delineate all the possibilities of what might happen because then you contaminate your experiment. Other army experiments continued on mental patients around the country. Work done at the Tulane Medical Center in New Orleans involved several drugs, hallucinogenics, and electrodes implanted in the brain. From one of the progress reports, a report of a woman who had electrodes implanted in the brain and was then given LSD and other drugs. She became agitated, cried, lapsed into a trance-like state. Felt as if she were about to have a convulsion. Experienced waves of darkness and light. Had bizarre sensations in her neck and legs. Said somebody was trying to manipulate her body. By far, the most chilling experiments we have uncovered took place at this Gothic estate called Raven's Crag, halfway up Mount Royal in Montreal. It houses the Allen Memorial Institute of Psychiatry of McGill University. It was here that the CIA funded a series of experiments, severe experiments. The work was done by the Institute's then director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. It is the closest experimentation to brainwashing yet disclosed. His work, unprecedented in psychiatry, consisted of three areas which he called sleep therapy, psychic driving, and the ultimate depatterning. Dr. Maurice Dangier, current head of the Allen Memorial Institute. In his uh, psychic driving, uh, so-called uh, type of, of therapy, he would give the patient intensive uh, electric treatment in order to make the patient to regress deeply, uh, become forgetful, and then he would uh, attempt to implant new ideas uh, in the mind of the patient. Now, to a layman, it would appear that Dr. Cameron was trying to take the slate and wipe it clean, the slate being the mind. In other words, brainwashing. Exactly, that's a very good comparison. Brainwashing. Yes, to life. Val Orlico of Winnipeg, Canada, the wife of a member of the Canadian Parliament, was a patient of Dr. Cameron's. She entered the Allen Memorial Institute because of severe depression. She describes for the first time publicly the LSD therapy and psychic driving treatment that she was given by Dr. Cameron. The drug began to take hold very rapidly because it was an IV injection and um, Things became very furry and uh, very frightening and uh, had a lot of sensations that it's very difficult to recall. Nobody explained it to me. Nobody ever asked me if I was willing to do it or anything. The next step was what he called psychic driving. This involved almost endless tape-recorded messages and more drugs for the patient. Cameron wrote that this was the way to make direct control changes in personality. The most severe technique Cameron used was depatterning. He described it as breaking up the existing patterns of behavior 
by means of intensive electroshock therapy with prolonged periods of sleep. He carried out these experiments in something he called the sleep rooms. People in there were like babies. They cried and they were very disoriented. And we were very afraid of the sleep room. We used to walk very carefully against the side of the corridor that was opposite the sleep room with our backs to the wall when we'd go by. Cameron used this combined sleep electroshock treatment on patients as long as 30 days. One patient he kept asleep for 65 days. Cameron retired and his successor, Dr. Robert Cleghorn, ordered a follow-up study on the patients treated with Cameron's depatterning method. It showed that it was no more beneficial in its result than the use of more conservative methods. But the follow-up study showed that 60% of those who had been depatterned still had amnesia for periods of anywhere from six months to 10 years. That's quite a memory loss, isn't it? That is a memory loss, indeed it is. It's uh, more, I think, more than desirable. In retrospect, does Dr. Cameron's experimentation and his treatment appear harsh? I wouldn't call it harsh. I would say it was harder on the staff than it was on the patients because these people had to be fed and they had to be cared for and they had to be uh, given sufficient fluid and food and toileted and so on and so forth. It was a, a very difficult uh, thing for uh, the staff to... Uh, to, uh, to follow these patients properly and see that they, they did well. <laughs> well, I'm glad he was concerned for the staff. But damn it all, I, I wouldn't... I, I, I could have maybe had a different kind of life. And that makes me angry and sad and... I don't know what, how to explain how I feel, really. I just, I just... <laughs> As for Dr. Cameron, he died in 1966 while mountain climbing. A colleague wrote of Cameron, for him the ends justified the means, and when one is dealing with a waste of human potential, it is easy to adopt this stance. Dr. Cameron seemed ideally suited for what the CIA had in mind. I thought this was the coldest and most impersonal treatment that anybody could give to anybody in the world. And I became more and more despondent and more and more angry. I just became so despondent that I thought I can't, I can't live like this any longer. And I thought I would just go out and throw myself underneath the cars on McGregor. I stood on the curb of that street and, and I stood there and I thought, okay, go, okay, go. And then I thought, what if you're not killed? What if you're just maimed? What if you don't die and you live and you can't even talk anymore? And I couldn't do it. Covering a span of history such as we are in this report, one can get sidetracked by the so-called glamour and mystery of espionage work or by the exotic qualities of some drugs. But what you can't lose sight of is what all of this would mean in terms of individual human beings. There would be deaths, there would be long-lasting and harmful effects. The search for mind control continued, but could the mind be controlled? Perhaps not. But is human behavior predictable? In this area, the CIA did make a significant breakthrough. A personality assessment system designed by the agency's chief psychologist, John Gittinger. It comes close to being able to predict how humans will behave. It's really a descriptive system, an attempt to try to describe personality in a relatively systematic way, so that hopefully you can get some kind of an idea to predict what the behavior between different kinds of individuals. Your assessment staff played a key role in helping other governments pick their police intelligence agencies, including, we've learned, the Korean CIA, Uruguayan National Police. Can you tell us about this? No. But one of the basic functions of getting your system was finding the vulnerabilities of an agent, a double agent, or a potential agent. In its applicability to intelligence work, isn't the PAS system looking for a person's soft spot? 
Well, of course, the answer to that is yes, but I, I, has, I hasten to say soft spot. This is a, what I consider a negative word. Of the hundreds of behavioral projects undertaken by the CIA, Getting Ears appears to have been one of the more successful and more conventional. Other experiments were not as conventional. Neurophysicist Dr. Jose Delgado was financed by the Office of Naval Research. In this experiment, the bull is sedated. Electrodes are implanted in its brain. Delgado transmits an electronic impulse to the center of the bull's brain. Delgado has remote control of the animal. Recently released CIA documents refer to the feasibility of remote control of animals and that special investigations will be conducted toward the application of selected elements of these techniques to man. Other areas were examined through the 60s and 70s. Brain surgery, psychosurgery, creation of amnesia, parapsychology, manipulation of genes. Even though past and present CIA officials have indicated this kind of work ended in 1963. And one of those who took part in these programs. Thank you, sir. In 1977, the Senate subcommittee heard testimony from many of them. But the testimony was not that revealing. According to one of them, they agreed amongst themselves to keep the inquiry within bounds that would satisfy the committee. Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, whom we recently filmed near his California home, oversaw many of the CIA behavioral programs. He retired in 1973 and destroyed the records of this work. In sort of a valedictory letter, Dr. Gottlieb wrote that he and his colleagues had been able to maintain contact with the leading edge of developments in the field of biological and chemical control of human behavior. Has mind control been achieved? From all of the available evidence, it appears doubtful. The human will has prevailed up to this point. But as we have seen, work is continuing in this field, work that we still don't know very much about. How deeply are the Russians and other dictatorships into all of this? We really can't say and the CIA is reluctant to give out information about it. But the basic question remains, what place does all of this have within a democracy? As one of the persons who worked on these programs told us, we are very capable, conscientious, and very dedicated scientists working for our country. How did you feel when you learned that Dr. Cameron's experimentation was financed by the CIA? Well, I thought, Oh, I can't even use the word <laughs> that I thought, <laughs> because I thought that bastard, and he was too smart. To, he knew, he knew who he was working for, and, um, excuse me, but, um, I just, you know, I just can't, sometimes I can't believe it, and yet I know it's true. If you had the opportunity to say something to the people at the Central Intelligence Agency who financed this study, what would you say? I, I realize the CIA is a very important organization and they have a very important job to do, but God, it surely doesn't have to be done on people who are totally incapable of knowing what's happening or having any defense against it. And I, I, I can't imagine the mentality of people who would do this. I just can't. Stay tuned for local news next. Right after Twiggy and Dirk Benedict of Battlestar Galactica star in I Want Her Dead on the Tuesday Movie of the Week. Thank you.